Oké, okay, goed afternoon everyone. Um, I was asked to say a few words about the conditioned response. And I will not speak about the docs of Pavlov, but actually a little bit. <laughs> so I will speak about chronic pain. Um, and chronic pain patients, they do hope that there will a pain relief solution. But the reality is often that they suffer from pain, that they have confusing message and that they are somewhat lost. Um, and looking for, for searching for solutions. So I will say keep calm, there is a cure for chronic pain and uh, I will try to explain a few principles uh, today. So if we have a patient with chronic pain, the first thing to do is try to understand the behavior. And I will make an analogy with another uh, situation. If you are afraid of spiders, the natural reflex is to run away. Um, it's just because of your, uh, you're afraid of the spider, so woohoo, flight, flight reaction. And it, everyone understands that's a phobia. But when it comes to other situations, then people have difficulties to make the link between behavior and beliefs or emotions. And that's something surprising. So this is a model I haven't established myself. Uh, it's also old because it was developed in 1984, but this um, psychologists make the link between ideas, beliefs, and also emotions, the fact that people want to have an interpretation and the actual behavior. And if you want, as physiotherapists, change a behavior, I think it starts with the beliefs and the emotions and not with the behavior. So let me give you an example of my research field, which is low back pain. If the patient is convinced that it's because of a hernia, the logical reaction will try to have medical imaging to confirm the herniated disc, to avoid bending, because they believe that bending will increase, will push the disc backwards in the spine. And the problem is that the pain stays. So in the head of the patient, this is not normal, because he did everything that was good for a hernia and is still suffering from pain. And you also have a similar uh, um, reaction based on the emotional aspect. So both on the cognitive side and on the emotional side, you have some ideas, you have some emotions, and you will have a behavior, a coping strategy, according to your beliefs or to your emotions. So let me give you an example of um, hemophilia. You have pain. Of course, your first reaction is questioning whether it's bleeding. And then the whole behavior will follow. And this is perfectly normal. The only problem comes when the pain is not related to the bleeding. Then you understand that the behavior is not appropriate. Um, several researchers have demonstrated that both patients and healthcare providers are uh, experiencing a lot of difficulties to distinguish pain from bleeding and pain from joint pain. And I cert I'm sure that a few patients and a few healthcare providers are able to do that, but not everyone will do that, will be able to do that, because you're not frequently suffering from bleeding or because the symptoms are very similar. So if we continue to make this association between acute pain and bleeding, then we have a problem. And I'm absolutely not here to blame anyone, neither the patient nor the healthcare provider. I just think that we have here an opportunity to shake hands, to discuss, and to see how we can manage the problem as we did in low back pain the last 20 years, because we thought that low back pain was a problem of the back, but actually it's not. It's a problem of the central nervous system and interpretation of the signals in the brain. So we have to look somewhat uh, broader than only the lower back. So my claim is to have a bigger assessment of pain in patients with hemophilia, um, because under assessment of pain is a cause of inadequate pain management, Um, and also to avoid making this unconditional link between acute pain and bleeding, because an acute pain can also be a flare-up of a joint arthropathy. And again, if we as healthcare provider make this link, patient will also make this link. So use the acute and chronic terminology to indicate, to refer to timeline, but not to the cause, because this is confusing for the patient. So for the assessment of pain, You are all familiar with a lot of tests, and I will not speak about the articular evaluation, the ultrasound evaluation to differentiate the bleeding and joint 
I will let experts talk about that. But I will talk about the psychosocial factors. And we call those factors yellow flags. Just why, I don't know, but that's a tradition in low back pain. And yellow flags are very important because it has been proven that they are of major prognostic value. It means that two low back pain patients um, can have a different prognosis based on the yellow flags. And a lot of researchers try to find nice ways to present that. Here you have the A, B, C, D, E, F, and you can continue until W. Or you have just a simple version, cognitions, emotions, and behavior. So what do we um, evaluate? We evaluate the attention to pain, and it's perfectly normal to have attention towards pain. But the problem becomes when you're not able to have some kind of distraction from pain. Because then we know hypervigilant reaction will increase pain intensity. And distraction will lead uh, to uh, decreased pain intensity. Also the cognitions, how we think about pain, will influence our behavior. So this is something we can do in uh, treatments to try to have a discussion with patients. Once the bleeding has been uh, established, diagnosed, you can take clotting factors, but the bleeding will decrease, but the pain can stay. And it's not because the pain stays that, that we have nothing to do. We can uh, help our patients. Regarding the emotional part, it's the same. Patients have worries, they have fears, and it's perfectly normal. And this morning I talked about the um, uh, connection in the brain, in uh, different brain parts that are dealing with uh, uh, stimuli from uh, uh, related to pain and the emotions. So the link between emotions and pain is perfectly normal. But if we as healthcare providers, we avoid talking about pain or about emotions, it seems we give the message to the patient that it's not important or that it's not real. And that's wrong, I think. So this is an example of uh, a slide I use with my patients. Um, as I said, I see a lot of chronic low back pain patients, and I ask what they think caused the lower back and what they are fearing of worrying. And a lot of patients say that they are afraid of not being able to work anymore. This example was a, a person who was lifting a lot of boxes, um, and his biggest fear was to become paralyzed and I was able to reassure him he will not be paralyzed. Um, of course, this is a, a simple version of a, of a psychological model, but it starts with a pain experience, and the next step is how you, you um, think about it. Are you ruminating? That's a part of pain catastrophizing. Are you experiencing fear? Uh, if you have fear, it's logic to avoid some movements, and you will heard we will hear in the, this conference that movement is very important, that physical activity is important. But it's also very important to acknowledge that this is influenced by the environment. And so negative message or threatening illness information will influence the system. So if patients continue to receive the message that acute pain is bleeding-related pain, then it will add to these fears, and that's perfectly normal. Um, I give you a few examples of patient stories. Um, and again, it's not to blame anyone. It just happened that patients do not understand what the physician tried to tell or that the physician was not that familiar with pain. My physician tells me there's nothing wrong with me and that I should consult a psychologist. Why? If you don't give any additional information, the patient thinks that the pain is not real. And then this patient starts to ruminate and then you get pain catastrophizing, and then you get the vicious circle. And this is a cartoon I use with my patients, and I think it's not correct in everyone, but sometimes it is correct. If you are suffering pain, it's not funny, so you are worrying. So the major part of your thoughts are about pain and about uh, the fact that it's not fun. Um, I spoke this morning about the pain assessment. Very briefly, you have three types of pain mechanisms. You can have musculoskeletal pain or nociceptive pain, if it's a bleeding or a joint atropathy. But it's also possible to have pain that is originating from a nerve. And then we speak about neuropathic pain. And finally, in chronic pain patients, you see a lot of changes in the brain and in the central nervous system. And then we speak about neuroplastic pain. And just to give one example, the treatment uh, approach, also the approach for exercise, is very different in a patient with neuroplastic pain and a patient with nociceptive pain. So this underscores the importance of better pain knowledge. So what is the summary of this talk? It's 
always a priority to exclude a bleeding. But even if there is a bleed, pain should be taken seriously. And there are a lot of options, treatment options, that are not well uh, taken into account. Um, please speak about the cognitions and the emotions of the patients, because they will have a major prognostic value. And please also take a look at the pain mechanisms. I just give you one example of slide that I use in my patients to explain them that in case of neuroplastic pain, the pain signal isn't any reliable anymore. And this is an example of the complexity of pain. If you look at the left side, you see four boxes. And if you look at the right side, you see three boxes. And it's just one slide to explain the complexity of pain to the patients. And both patients are right, because they are having another perspective to pain. And this is another example. If you have a burglar alarm, normally you should have a big reaction if there is a burglar. That's the purpose of the alarm. And you can have a stress reaction, which is perfectly normal because there is a burglar in your house. But if you have a sensor that is hyperactive uh, and it's uh, set off the alarm when there is a fly going on before the sensor, you have the same panic attack in the people living in the house, but there is no burglar. This is an example we use often in our patients to explain that there is pain, but that there is no damage, not necessarily damage. So these are examples we can use in clinical practice to make this more concrete to our patients. Consequences of daily living, if you keep in uh, the uh, pain and uh, if you do not understand the, the, the appropriate reaction, is that uh, activity goes downwards. So I would say have hope. Maybe we cannot decrease pain, in, uh, end pain in every patient, but we can decrease it. And I will just last slide. On the right side, you have the brain activity in a patient with low back pain, performing a task that was not painful. Everything in red is active. And on the left side, you have the same patient, but after pain neurophysiology. And you have only the motor cortex, which is active during the same task, which wasn't painful, but was a motor task. So we can really make the difference in our patients if we explain pain. And that was what I wanted to say. Thank you.